Hello and welcome, my name is Dr. Jack. Thanks for joining me on this video. In this video, we'll be discussing a class of antidepressants known as SSRIs or selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. We'll be talking about the latest data on this class of medication and ask the question of just how effective is this popular class of medication in treating depression? The answer may shock you, so let's get into it. Before we get started, for those that follow the channel, I want to apologize for how long it's been since I put out a video. I have nearly five different video scripts ready to go, but just haven't found the time to film and edit them. I promise to keep making videos and putting them out on topics I've researched if you continue to find them interesting and worthy to share and talk about whenever I have the time to do so. So please let me know what you think of the video content in the comments below as always. So with that out of the way, let us talk about the focus of this video. The most common SSRIs are drugs like Lexapro, Zoloft, and Prozac. They first came out in the 1980s and were hailed as a wonder drug to treat depression. It was deemed safe and okay for any doctor with a medical license to prescribe it regardless of whether they had any psychiatric training. By 2019, one in eight Americans or 43 million people were on these medications. In 2017, in the United Kingdom, 17% of the adult population were on it. I do not have the latest numbers since the pandemic hit, but I assure you it is higher now given all the mental illness that we are seeing during this stressful time. SSRIs may help with things like stress, severe depression, and anxiety, but when it comes to other symptoms like loss of interest, motivation, and energy, it does not seem to have as much of an effect. This may be why most people taking SSRIs report feeling an emotional numbness or dulling of their emotions. According to the CDC, more than 60% of Americans on SSRIs have been on them for more than two years, and over 6 million people have been on them for more than a decade now. And like many drugs that are for depression, pain, anxiety, and things of that nature, some people are beginning to wonder how many people stay on them, not because they are getting benefits, but more to keep withdrawal from occurring. You see, SSRI withdrawal can be pretty bad. You can see panic attacks, sleep disturbance, and depression. In some cases, the depression that recurs after coming off of it can be worse than the original depression it was prescribed to treat. In one study in the UK, they found that 56% of those that came off of antidepressants had withdrawal effects, and half of them described it as severe and could last many, many months. As a pain doctor, I see this quite frequently. If the time is taken to sit down with a patient and ask them why they are taking opiate long term, You'd be surprised, many of them describe withdrawal issues that make them feel bad, and then when they take an opiate, they naturally feel better. Many people are unaware that they are no longer treating pain with the opiate, but treating withdrawal instead. When it comes to SSRIs, the psychiatric community is divided into two different camps. In one camp, you have people wanting to revisit the usage of SSRIs as a main treatment for depression. Then in the other camp, you have people saying that these drugs save lives and the latest research casting doubt on this class of medications is dangerous for people, especially those who need it the most. A new research article published on July of 2022 has generated a lot of attention. One of those researchers was Dr. Howowitz. His paper, The Serotonin Theory of Depression, a Systematic Umbrella Review of the Evidence, is focused on finding out whether these drugs are really as effective as claimed by the pharmaceutical world. His focus is on the neurotransmitter serotonin, and his main question is how involved is serotonin when it comes to clinical depression? You see, serotonin has several functions, and it is a chemical or neurotransmitter that is released at the end of nerve cells. It eventually gets reabsorbed, but SSRIs inhibit this reabsorption, and hence you have more serotonin floating around. That's why it's named selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. The prevailing belief for a long time was that low serotonin leads to depression. This theory is actually so ingrained within our thought processes that it is believed that between 85 to 90% of the public believe that serotonin levels cause depression. Dr. Horowitz and his team reviewed previous studies that involved thousands of people, and he ultimately arrived at the conclusion that there is very little, if any, evidence that serotonin is linked to depression. In a Newsweek interview, he said, quote, the drug companies convinced us that if you're sad, you should go to your doctor and seek treatment. They've made us all believe that normal aspects of the human condition are a medical illness called major depressive disorder. That normal reactions to difficult situations are a chemical brain problem that needs a medical solution. They convince people that these are very mild drugs that are very easy to stop. None of this is true, end quote. 
What's interesting is that this conclusion was not surprising to the psychiatric world. You see, researchers have known for years that there is much more to depression than just low levels of serotonin. What was different this time was that the news media and social media got a hold of it and it went viral. And on Twitter, it actually reached the top 5% of most shared scientific papers. So with this knowledge and attention drawn to this topic, there's a big push now to reassess how we treat depression. Dr. Joanna Moncrief, who is a professor of critical and social psychiatry at University College of London, and the lead author of this study states that these drugs change the biochemistry of our brains and mental processes in ways that are similar to drugs like alcohol. She believes that what happens is that they create a state of emotional numbness that decreases the intensity of feelings brought on by things like depression and anxiety. However, the trade-off is that you are also numb to the effects of the positive emotions as well. She goes on to state that, quote, it's not helpful to think of depression as a brain disease. I think that we should be thinking of it as an emotional reaction to life circumstances and life events, end quote. However, it is not all bad when it comes to SSRIs. Proponents of SSRIs make the argument that if taken for less than six to nine months, it can actually help and here's how. It is widely known that stress from say the death of a loved one, career issues, or just family drama can lead to depression. When we are stressed, we release certain hormones and one of them is called glutamate. Glutamate puts the brain in a constant excited state. Glutamate is not all bad, however. When we are really excited about something, it is also released. But much like inflammation that I have talked about before, where acute inflammation may be beneficial to our body at times, but chronic inflammation wreaks havoc on our mind and body, you see the same thing with glutamate. When glutamate is constantly elevated, it becomes toxic to the brain. It can actually cause nerve cells to dysfunction by shrinking them and disrupting the nerve connections. This toxic environment then leads to other issues like insomnia, and then insomnia leads to even more stress, which causes even more glutamate to be released. Which by the way, if you need help sleeping, that was the topic of my last video. Feel free to check it out as the whole video offers up more natural sleep remedies. But getting back to glutamate, when it's chronically elevated, you can get caught in this really bad circle of stress leading to more and more glutamate release. It is here that the proponents of SSRIs feel it has a place in helping with depression and anxiety. Many believe that changing the levels of serotonin in this chain of events can help the brain begin to heal. It helps the neurons begin to function efficiently again and grow nerve cells. Some believe that this neuroplasticity explains why SSRIs can take a couple of weeks for it to work because the timeline is consistent with how long this process takes to occur. However, even after understanding all of this, it doesn't mean that we should take the drug for years. I always tell my patients that if we start a powerful drug, what's the end point? There has to be a plan in place before you start a powerful mind altering medication. Expectations and goals must be laid out first before ever getting onto the ramp to the highway. You should first figure out where the off ramps are. In the case of SSRIs, I think it's important to ask what's the plan after six to nine months? We have to begin to answer this question of why are 26 million Americans taking SSRIs for two or more years and some for over a decade? After the Harowitz study came out, a team of researchers at the US FDA published what some would say is the most comprehensive analysis of every antidepressant clinical trial to date, even the unpublished ones. They looked at 232 placebo-controlled trials with over 73,000 participants diagnosed with major depressive disorder. Their conclusion was that the 10 most common prescribed antidepressant medications helped only 15% of the time and nearly always in those from the most extreme of depression. So this begs the question of why are they prescribed so much when it seemingly has little effect on those with mild to moderate symptoms of depression? Well, then we need to discuss the placebo effect. Studies have shown that the placebo effect is helpful in 30 to 40% of cases of depression. If you want to learn more about placebo, I did talk about it in more detail and the power of it in a video I did a while back when talking about CBD and how much of it is placebo versus reality. So feel free to check that out. Here's the thing that most people do not realize. Say you are a pharmaceutical company with a new drug and you want to get FDA approval. One of the things you have to do is show two well-designed clinical trials that show the drug is more potent than a placebo. And once you've done this, you can submit it to the FDA and all is good in the world as your drug works better than placebo, right? Well, not exactly. You see, while two studies are needed pitting placebo against your drug, the rules do not say how many trials you can run until you get the data you want. So theoretically, you can run 10 trials and eight of them show no effect versus placebo, but two do, and you can submit those studies. 
The eight negative results must be registered with the FDA, but they are not required to be published by the drug companies. In fact, the Newsweek article interviewed Dr. Eric Turner, a former FDA clinical reviewer, was so shocked when he worked for the FDA on the number of negative trials for the first psychotropic drug application that he immediately rushed the findings to his boss in the late 1990s. His boss' response was that, quote, it happens all the time, end quote. It has been shown that 40% of depression is quote unquote mild. In one study at Brown University of 147 patients, yet they were prescribed antidepressants 97% of the time. What's concerning is that in the US, things do not seem to be getting better. In the UK, once they looked at the data, they made it where antidepressants should no longer be suggested as first line therapy for less severe depression. In the US, from 2009 to 2019, the amounts of high school students who reported feelings of hopelessness or sadness increased by 40% and involves one out of three students. By all estimates, this number is higher now due to the pandemic, and we can only guess how many of these students will be placed on SSRIs for an undetermined amount of time. There are other options that should be tried before SSRI therapy. These include cognitive behavioral therapy, exercise, meditation, and by the way, check out my meditation video if you're so interested, I highly suggest it. There's also counseling or psychotherapy. And with psychotherapy, it helps to improve coping skills. And it not only is more effective at treating depression, but also safer. The problem with all of this in today's world is twofold. One is availability of therapists and counselors, as well as the cost of such therapy. The other is the mentality of people today. Many go to their clinician with a quote unquote, you need to fix me quickly attitude. And the fact is that these suggested therapies take time and effort on the patient's part. A common saying I'm always saying to my patients is that I can help you, but you gotta help me help you, otherwise I will fail in the long run. You'd be surprised by how many people actually never even attempt to make that effort. So we'll go ahead and wrap this up with this video here. Don't forget to do all that YouTube stuff, like, comment, subscribe, share, notification bell. It really does help these videos reach more people and therefore help people understand these topics better. I hope you've learned something new here. And so until next time, take care, stay safe. Bye-bye. Pura Vida.